DeLuna Coffee is owned and operated by diehard Florida State fans and boosters, the Lemmix family in Pensacola. So cut them some slack for their hurricane blend. No green and orange, and it's definitely not all about some random letter in the alphabet. It simply is a blend for those of you who love that strong coffee flavor without bitterness. DeLuna has combined two different South American beans with a Hawaiian bean. In fact, the Hurricane Blend has won as many ACC titles as the school in Coral Gables. Try it or one of their other two dozen blends and get a discount when you use the promo code WARCHANT15. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Coffee's for closers only. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What's up, everybody? It's Wake Up Warchant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. DeLunaCoffee.com. Come explore our world of coffee. Promo code is Warchant15. Shout out to Dan Squatch. Uh... I, I don't have it ready because I'm just terrible at my job some days, Cord, but you're here to always uplift me. But apparently our guy, uh, Bourbon is your friend, subscriber of Warchant.com, a.k.a. Dave from Bardstown, a.k.a. T-Bone's father. He, T-Bone's father, Dave from Bardstown, Kentucky, and T-Bone met up with our guy Dan Squatch, who like does kayaking and outdoor trips, and they had this whole big like outdoor adventure and they munched on some DeLuna almonds that are covered in, like, chocolate and, uh, you know, coffee-infused goodness. Look okay. what we're doing, Corey. Look what we're doing. Well, we're bringing the world together it, with DeLuna uh, in the middle. Uh, it, it, yeah, man, that's, that's kind of how life's supposed to be, isn't it? Wake up, War Champ, bringing people together. I don't understand. So did they meet? Where did they do this? In Kentucky or Tallahassee? No, I think somewhere in Appalachia. I think maybe. Oh, okay. I, I want to say North Carolina, but I'm not 100% sure on these things. Because I don't know exactly where Dan Squatch is. But Dan Squatch is from four days ago. Dave in Bardstown, T-Bone, and Papa Tom came down for that fishing trip this week. We absolutely crushed two tins of the chocolate-covered salted caramels. Oh, those mm. almonds. Oh, oh, that sounds so good. They are awesome. You guys are awesome. Appreciate y'all as always. So, yeah, like, I think he mentioned that that's what he did, like, outdoor trips and, and I don't know, like, a, a, a guide or whatever. And then Dave is like, hey, man, can you help me get in touch with that guy? I'm like, I don't I don't know Dan Squatch's stuff, but if you hop on a live show on YouTube and we're doing one, I'm sure he's on there. And they uh, exchange info. Look at that, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's what we do, man. That's what we do. You guys are welcome. And, and everyone listening, you're more than welcome to meet up with other listeners and tell us about it. Tell us how it goes. Hmm. That's right. That's right. All right, you know what we also do on the show? We ask you to hit the thumbs up button, and we talk about Florida State Athletics. Warchant.com, your ultimate symbol sports source. Promo code is Warchant30. Five-star rating with a review would be much appreciated. Corey, let's get right to it, man. I think we did not speak about this, um, but it's actually going over pretty well. It's going over quite well. I was a little bit apprehensive, Corey, when we started unveiling the first installment in our What If series. It is the offseason, mm. after all. You folks want to talk about football, so... I don't. All we can really do is deal in hypotheticals. So we threw out a hypothetical, which you know, part of my concern here, Corey, was that I, I, I don't know, man. I feel like there's this, this current of Jordan Travis support because it's all Ira's fault. I mean, Ira's the kingmaker, and Ira really went to bat for Jordan amidst the the horribleness that was 2020 to point out that he was the lone positive. He's pretty much a lone playmaker. He's the only one he could really count on. Uh, throughout the the glum that was the last season to, to kind of deliver on some good moments. So, and he's true. He's got some, there's some validity to it, but I, I thought there'd be a lot of people that would push back to our first installment, what, which was what if Mackenzie Milton performs at the level he did in 2017 and 18 when he was in Orlando. So you, I, Gene, uh, Ira discuss what if not saying it's going to happen, not discounting, Jordan Travis. I thought there was going to be a lot of pushback about, hey, man, didn't you guys say that he actually outperformed McKenzie in spring? Why are you talking about this? But there's a lot of uh, sort of positive vibes bubbling from it. Uh, what did you want to add to the conversation about what if McKenzie Milton performed at the 2017-18 level he did in Orlando? Here now. No, I mean, the, I think the three of you guys answered it uh, more factually than I did in the sense that you're like, well, it would mean this and it would mean that. It would mean, you know, the offense is better and the wide receivers have more catches and the, there's more yardage and more points. 
I just wonder, I wonder and, and think about what it would mean for the national perception of Florida State for one season. Because Florida State has never been a feel-good story. I, even with Bowden, who's like one of the nicest head coaches in the history of the world, there were never, you never felt like Florida State was beloved. Um, may, maybe the late 80s, I don't know, when they were first starting the dynasty. Then all that winning got real old real quick, and people weren't happy about it anymore. And then Jimbo came along. That certainly wasn't a lovable uh, decade. I thought we were and then, all right though before that. I thought like Herbie always spoke well about Jimbo, and I, I never. But no, yeah. but I don't think no. You wouldn't think that like casual college football fans have not rooted for Florida State in how long? Yeah, when I they don't know since the late seventies. Has a casual fan ever rooted for Alabama though? Really. You know? Well, right, but it's usually ruining against them, maybe? Like, Florida State is, like, not the opposite of beloved. So now you have a player that would, um, you, you know, the whole the, much of the country would be rooting for him. It would be a feel-good story hmm. that Mackenzie Milton, this kid that they were worried couldn't walk and would, didn't, would never play football again, and now he's a starting court. This, again, all what if. It's a hypothetical is the starting quarterback and has regained his form and is playing like he did three years ago, that would be one of the stories of college football. And Florida State hasn't... Jameis Winston was the story of college football for the first half of 2013 with his greatness. The rest of his career, it was not about anything on the football field when it came to Jameis Winston. And they haven't had a lot of feel-good stories before or since. This would be one. And every, I just think the whole country, media types too, maybe they want to see Florida – I mean, why would they want to see Florida State lose to Louisville? They wouldn't. They're going to be rooting for McKenzie Milton. I think casual fans will root for McKenzie Milton. I think Central Florida fans will root for McKenzie Milton. So this is – it would be a weird, uh, almost unprecedented place for Florida State football to be in if this kid plays like he did three years ago. No, it'll be a six-month – it'll be a – whatever. It'll be a three-month, four-month um, trial run. And as soon as McKenzie Milton leaves, it would be back to everybody hating Florida State. But how odd would it be to have like the piano music going for a game day feature with a positive storyline for a Florida State football player? It just doesn't happen. So that that was my biggest takeaway is what it would mean. Uh, yeah, obviously we know it would mean more points, the offense would be better, and wins. I think you could I think you could tag if he played like he did in seventeen, which again is a big big old what if. I mean, you're tagging 10 extra points to what they scored last year, at least, um, which is should equate to at least three or four more wins. So that's a that's the biggest deal. The second biggest deal, though, is just Florida State actually being um, a feel-good story, which just has never been the case since I was – I don't know if I've ever remembered a case where they were the feel-good story. Oh, come on. What about, uh, what about Travis Rudolph eating lunch with a young man in, uh, at school? I mean, that was a that was a one. Kidding, it wasn't like every week yeah. people were tuning in. Man, how, how'd Rudolph do today? That was a four day blip, and they did it for the Ole Miss game, and then that was a forgotten, uh, forgotten, almost forgotten. This is different. It's every week, and it's a starting quarterback, and it's a guy that was a household name before. And it, you know, Travis Rudolph. You know, some fans knew him, but he wasn't the he wasn't McKenzie Milton. It, I think you're not taking into account how beloved McKenzie Milton was before this. Like you read Twitter, you saw all those stories written about him, and I mean, they—it it, was—it was like the dude was the king of Orlando, hmm. and so I, I just think that would to, for him to come back and have a great season after what he's been through, even people that dislike Florida State heavily will probably root for him. They might want them to lose thirty-eight to thirty-seven, but they will feel good for the starting quarterback at Florida State. I mean, usually it's a cesspool. I don't try to go into the Twitter comments, but man, there was um, there was like a hand. There's a oh, like over a dozen or a half dozen of them. They're all pretty uh, upbeat. Uh, Marcus, uh, so he responds. What it would mean? Possible playoff parents, possible Heisman. Another guy. Bunch of people in this media and fan base must have forgot who TF. That means who the blank. blank. Hmm. Uh, McKenzie is. As long as he lines up a quarterback, I'm confident going to every game this season. Another person, uh, if that's a case of him winning and performing that way, I think eight and four could be in play. Uh, Y'all talking New Year's six Heisman playoff need to chill. Another person says ten and two, nine and three likely. So look at that. What well, is and I think kind of united. But I think they also recognize that it's a it's a pretty substantial hypothetical, right? Like we're not saying this is going to happen. I don't. I really am not confident at all. He will even be the starter. You know what I mean? That's like, why this I, was, is like, straight I was a little apprehensive about us coming out the gate with this one. But, because... you know, he might he might have a great August and then turn that into a great fall. 
and if he can turn into the guy or turn back into the guy that he was um, three years ago, yeah, man, you're talking about an elite thrower of the football that's going to make everybody better. You know, I think he probably had better receivers at UCF when he was there than he currently has now. At least he had more proven guys. But, man, a great quarterback, a guy that sees it and gets rid of it quickly on time, that can, that that lifts everything. That makes everything better. Um, like I brought up on the video that we did. Man, Kenny Shaw was a decent player at Florida State. Then he became a household name and, you know, a, a guy – a guy that almost got a thousand yards receiving because of who was throwing the ball. Like all of a sudden, Kenny, even when he's just a little bit open, was getting the ball. We're used, to, you know, it used to be that just wasn't the case. The middle of the field wasn't really open for business. Kenny Shaw didn't have a great career. His whole, I don't know, his whole status at Florida State changed because of the guy that was throwing the football. I think Mackenzie Milton might have a similar impact if if he's that guy, right? Because that guy was great. He really was. Go watch those films, man. He or the highlights, not the films. We're not in the '80s. You know, we don't have a reel to reel. Put the projector on. Turn yeah, it on. put the projector on uh, to dim the lights. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I, you go back and watch those highlights, man. He is putting it on point, on time, and he has this air about him that I know I'm going to score 50 points. I know we're going to win. Now he's also in a different conference now, playing against better players, and the disparity in talent from his team to the opposing team has shrunk considerably from what it was in 2017, 2018. Uh, but still, I, I just think an elite quarterback play, and that was elite what he was doing three and four years ago, uh, would, would go a long way. I mean, I think, yeah, man, I, I think you – I don't think eight wins is out of, out of the realm of possibility. If you're averaging 10 more points a game, which I think isn't outlandish for a, for a step-up in quarterback play. And again, I want to point out, I'm a big fan of Jordan Travis. And I think Jordan Travis might have a chance to be a very good college quarterback, maybe even early as this year. But nobody could argue that he was a great thrower of the football last year. And you look at his numbers, you look at the passing game in general, it was subpar, to be kind, for the Florida State football team in 2020. It was a subpar passing game. If that became above average to go along with the way they want to run the football, well, now I think you're looking at 10 or 12 extra points a game probably, I don't know, 70, 80 more yards per game, and that's going to translate, it should, into three or four more wins at the very least, I would think. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of people that come back with the, and I, I get everybody, and you must be an absolute joy at parties, you know. doesn't matter if the defense doesn't stop people. But isn't it to say that this also probably helps the defense have less high-leverage situations? Uh, yes. You know, make teams have to play from behind, make, the, make opposing teams a little bit more predictable, thus – Again, less high leverage situations. And I'm not trying to make a pass for, for Adam Fuller. And the same token, and if it doesn't work out, if your offense is, is producing at the way that you're accustomed to or the way that you envisioned, if you're Kenny and Mike, well, hey, man, if the defense doesn't pull their weight, then you kind of know what needs to be done. It's, it's apparent to everybody. You gave the guys a fair chance. You gave them some better groceries. It didn't work out. It happens. We move along. It'd be another thing if the offense continues to stagnate and your defense is struggling. I mean, you're still going to save yourself and be self-preservation and probably get rid of your defensive coordinator. But if you're a fan, at least you're that much closer to having some sort of resolution on really what is holding you back. Um, because, listen, the defense was not – the defense was horrible. It was, obviously. I'm not trying to stick up for it. The offense was also very underwhelming mm. uh, outside of, you know, opening drives in the first and second half and what they did in North Carolina. Duke was pretty Yeah, they were too, gross the, basically the whole season um, in the second half. Did nothing against anyone ever. Uh, and really didn't do much of anything if it wasn't involving Jordan Travis's legs. Um, so that, ha but again, I think you'd see maybe the the full capacity of what this offense can be with a quarterback who gets it, like Mackenzie Milton got it at UCF in seventeen and eighteen. So again, we know it's hypothetical, but it's a it, it's not one that's out out of the realm of possibility, right? Like I think that's another point I made on the video is like we we have seen this. This isn't like us projecting that Corey Durden is going to turn into a first round pick. Right. Or that Amari Gaynor is going to be the next Derek Brooks. Like, this isn't just create something we haven't seen before. Mm. McKenzie Milton has shown us his ceiling. He's shown us what he can do when he's playing well and at full capacity and, and, and full health. We, we've seen it, and it's really, uh, I was going to say glorious. Well, I will say glorious. <laughs> it's glorious. Um, so that's why I think that's more of a what if than if you said, what if Jordan Travis became a great? Well, Jordan Travis has never shown it. That's not that he says he can't do it. But McKenzie Milton has actually shown that he can play at this level. So it's just a matter of can he find it again. And if he can, man, yeah, Florida State's offense should be one of the better ones in the conference. And we haven't said that in 
five years, six years. Let me ask you this, Corey. I think you were, you were like six or seven ultras deep in the round table before I, I spoke. So you were like, all right, it's Aslan talk. I'll check out. I, I listen to him enough. But in, this, in the round table, I mentioned that if, again, this is what if, this is what if. And, and I mean, I think overall, Jordan played better than McKenzie this spring. Mm-hmm. But I think it's because McKenzie didn't play well. I don't really think Jordan played great. I think Jordan played good. But what the coaches said about him is really what kind of carries the weight for him. I think McKenzie had a better spring football game, though. But nonetheless, so what if McKenzie Milton does win the job and performs at a really high level? I say in the story that I think, you know, if Jordan stays around, if you're still able to develop him and he really does have this, you know, unreal next level accuracy and his footwork keeps growing and all these sort of things, you're in the best place you've been transitioning from one quarterback to the next since EJ and then you had Jameis. And before right. that, probably going from Casey to Charlie, which you should have probably jumped in and, and diso, uh, disagreed with. Flava Knoll said he would love to discuss this. He agrees that a recovered and successful Milton to Travis is the best recent transition since Manuel, Manuel, Manuel to mm-hmm. Winston. But do you really think, Aslan, that it's better than going from Ponder to EJ or from Busby to Winky or Canel to Busby, Ward to Canel, or even Winky to Ricks? Yeah, it's better than Winky to Ricks. If, if that's another what if Jordan Travis stays happy, stays healthy, continues to develop, shows good footwork, shows better accuracy. Yeah, I mean, if Mackenzie Milton plays at a 2017, 2018 level, which is cusp of a Heisman, and then you hand it off to this freak show kid who can now be a more developed, polished passer, I think that's better than Canel the Busby. I think it's better than Charlie to Danny. What yeah, it's you? so hard, man. It's just so hard to compare eras. Would, 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 if Thad Busby was on the team last year, would their record have been any different? Hmm. You know, Thad Busby got to play, and I'm not trying to kill Thad Busby. He got to play with incredible teams, with incredible players. Um, and, and, you know, he won a bunch of games, but, you know, he didn't he didn't play in the NFL. He, he wasn't an All-American candidate. He held down the spot that Cannell had held down before him and then Peter Tom Willis and Chip Ferguson and McManus and all these guys throughout the dynasty. But I don't know that I'd think that that Busby was anything special. Um, and so, yeah, but it's also, it's just hard to compare, you know? It's just hard to compare those eras. Um, I think it would be, if McKenzie Milton was at his level, and then Jordan Travis can grow into what we think he has the potential to be. I don't know if you can compare eras. I don't know what, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty dynamic one-two punch because Jordan Travis could be special, could be really, really good at the college level. Um, so let's hope he develops. And let's hope McKenzie goes out and wins a Heisman. Hmm. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Hmm. Real nice. That'd be real nice. All right. Um, we had a couple comments, a couple post, posts in the uh, Renegade Express thread. So let's grab one or two of those. Okay. Uh, and then we'll finish probably up with some later on in the week. I'm going to be in Atlanta with Michael at the Five Star Challenge. So I don't know if I'll be able to record a show. I'm going to try, though. I know the people want what they want. Before we get to these questions, though, there's some that are not uh, football related. Uh, what do you think about apparently Brooks and Bryce DeChambeau not being paired at the U.S. Open because Bryce and DeChambeau wants no, he doesn't want he wants none of the smoke as the kids would say apparently Corey you see that I, what, does he get to dictate who he gets to play with Well, apparently that the USGA reached out to him and his agent and they were like, yeah, no, we're good, we'd rather not. I mean, look, does it not make him look like the maybe the most mentally tough guy in the world? Of course. But you can also understand it. Like, it's hard enough to play in a U.S. Open. <laughs> and there is a lot of pressure, just I'm sure, internally for him. Didn't he win it last year? I think so. He won one of them. I don't know which one he, what he won. I thought it was the U.S. Open. But there's inherent pressure. There's, also, you know, there's internal pressure. It's a really hard course. And you don't need, uh, you know, drunk dudes walking down the course with you, goading you. Whether, I mean, you know, uh, Tiger and Phil played together and they didn't like each other. I mean, you, you can play with people you don't like. It's not like they're going to they're gonna get in a shoving contest on the fourth hole, Kepka and, and uh, DeChambeau. But yeah, I, I can understand how you'd like, all right, man, let's just, let's not even give them a, the, the crowd a reason to, uh, to go after them. And I, look, man, I, I, I've been at basketball games where people yell all kind of unspeakable things to these kids, the 19 year old, 18 year old college kids. And they're having to shoot with, it's basically an earthquake going on and they're having to shoot a free throw with an earthquake going on in the, in the arena. So I don't feel bad for millionaire golfers that probably grew up a certain way 
that get their feeling don't want to get their feelings hurt. It's like, man, that's part of sports. Grow up, just deal with it. But then it, golf is a different sport, right? Like, mm. you know, I, I just think golf has different um, decorum. Uh, whether it should or not, that's another discussion. But when you that is kind of what they present the sport to be. It's a gentleman's game and all that. You know, quote unquote gentleman's game. So yeah, I can I can see it. It doesn't. I I don't. I guess I really don't have an opinion one way or the other. I understand why he wouldn't want to do it. I also understand the other side of, yeah, look at the big baby. Get, get Using the USGA to bail him out of actually having to show some mental fortitude um, and be uncomfortable with his, with his playing partner. But, you know, either way, it's golf. Don't they both have yachts? <laughs> Probably. But, right? I know Kepka does, right? And, and uh, I'm sure DeChambeau, if he wants one, could go build one with all his, all his background in science. Um, I, you know, it's too hard to get too worked up over the, over the millionaire golfers, uh, baseball. Did you see, uh, so TCU who lost their head coach, who made them an actual somebody in the world of college baseball, Yeah. Uh, Texas A&M poached him and then TCU proceeded to, to, to promote from within. Can you believe that Corey? They, they mm. elevated their pitching coach to become the head coach, which, you know. One program that we covered did that, and that was what? Right, um, right. I will also, say this: uh, I, I, I wonder, uh, and I haven't talked to Meet about it. I, I wouldn't even, I would never ask him this question. I don't think. But was he relieved that Link didn't get to Omaha with no, that Notre Dame team? Or I think Link's a real friend. Yeah. And was he upset for Link? Because I mean, it is Notre Dame, and as much as we might think Link is a is a terrific coach and might be an up and coming uh, ba- a great baseball college baseball coach. I don't know that Notre Dame's going to get a ton of chances to be that close to a college World Series again. You know, what I mean, they, right. they're like a once every I would think once every decade, twice a decade type program that can have a real chance at Omaha, and they were that close to it. Uh, really blew that first game is when they blew it, um, and it, you know that, that maybe that was like maybe that will be the best Notre Dame team he ever had. Um, made a decent shot actually that that's the best Notre Dame team he ever he will ever have and they didn't make it to the college world series so I wonder if meet a little bit relieved because the guy that some people think should have t- gotten that job took Notre Dame to the cusp of the college world series but you know what they didn't get there either it's really hard to get to the college world series and at least you're not an Arkansas fan everyone that's at least you're not an Arkansas fan yeah Dave Van Horn now I think is like 21 seasons of making it to the postseason and he hasn't won at all so, and he was literally, is it a drop foul ball, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Out number yeah. three. Florida State's never been that close. <laughs> and, you know, that a man, a number – Florida State's never had a team that won 21-2 to two in the opening game of a Super Regional and then lost, uh-huh. um, didn't make it out. So that – and was number one in the country doing that. That's – uh oh, man. Tough break. Tough break, Hogs. <laughs> you got that football team to look forward to. Lost to an ACC team in two, so shout out mm-hmm. NC State for getting on So ACC's got two teams out there, right? Yeah. And then my SEC, SEC got three? Three, yeah. All right, so yeah, that seems about right. Well, and one of them, it, it, they're guaranteed to get representation because it was Tennessee versus LSU. So right. uh, yep. they profited off of that. Yeah, I mean, part of me was rooting for Notre Dame because they're eight. I, I didn't want to see an SEC school make it in, in Mississippi State, and I don't want to see Mississippi State win a College World Series before Florida State does. Mm. Although it's weird because like they have a pretty good tradition of yeah. baseball. And they really do a, really love and appreciate the, the sport. And I remember being mad when Coastal Carolina won. I'm like, Coastal Carolina is going to win it, and Mike Martin can't win it. Like they're gonna, The baseball guys are going to let this happen. So I, I'm, I'm not happy either way. Even like a, a deserving program, I don't want to see win one before yeah, Florida State. Yeah, so. but I've always thought that with like Mississippi State's been like the stepbrother to Florida State when it comes to like because Mississippi State has a, a a story tradition too. There, when you especially when I was growing up and in the '90s, when you thought of baseball powers, Mississippi State was one of the first. I don't know five or six teams you mentioned. Yeah, uh, they and they and they're still there. They're always good. That stadium is ridiculous, it's and they've never fair. won one either. Um, yeah, no. it's, you know, again, it's really hard. It's really hard to win one. Um, it's not, it's not hard enough that you shouldn't have one, but, but, uh, yeah, it's it just Mississippi state and Florida state are both proof that, uh, that it's really hard to get to Omaha. And then it's really hard to win when you're out there. Right. We're wondering what they're going to do to be able to get better next season. Uh, they're hitting the portal. Uh, there's apparently a, a portal in college baseball as well. Uh, they've apparently picked up the commitment of a young man from the power of North Atlanta highs been at Tennessee tech last few years, a guy named Brett Roberts, Corey. Okay. Uh, so he actually 
batted 343 this past season, five jacks, 39 ribbies. He went something like four for eight in their two games versus Vanderbilt and Tennessee, and I think he stole four bases. I think he stole three bases against Tennessee. Like every time he got, and on he's base, coming to Florida State. He's coming to Florida State. Yeah. Do you have stats like his stats from last year, like yeah. in front of you? What do you want? Strikeouts. Oh. Uh, it bats and strikeouts. They don't. I mean, it's come on. It's Tennessee Tech. They show it, but I mean, I, I can tell you this: he only struck. Well, no, he struck out twice or more in in several games. But he's not a strikeout <laughs> machine. He's not a strikeout okay. machine. All right. He All went right. several wanna... games. I mean, that game against Tennessee, he did not strike out. Okay. Um, All right. So hey, I'll take it. I'll take yeah. it. Just somebody that can put the bat on the ball occasionally. Yeah, you wish they like. Uh, there, we, there we go. Uh, he had 204 ABs, 31 Ks. Oh, that's – man, that's Tyler Martin territory. Yeah. Okay. So. That's, you know, a Florida State player with 201 at-bats, and I'm not joking, would have 65 strikeouts. So that's that's encouraging. Now he's not facing Tennessee Tech. Typically, he's not facing ACC caliber pitching. But still, guy that looks to uh, maybe put the bat on the ball a little bit. I like it. I like it. Meet more of that. Seventeen stolen bases too. So and he's a middle okay, infielder. All right. Hey, going uh, the softball route. So I don't know. I mean, I guess if if he leads off, then I wonder where you put Tyler. Uh, oh, I'm not saying I don't know the lead no. off. He maybe bat second, but you'll have two guys in the top of the lineup that are putting the ball in play and making the defense work a little bit. That's good. How many walks? Um, I'm saying yeah, we're going to go boom, boom, like him and then Tyler. He had only eight walks. <laughs> okay, well, look, that that might that number might jump up a little bit, Florida State. But, uh, yeah, man, I, I, love the, uh, I love the contact. Yeah, he's got a 343 batting average, but his, his OBP was only 375. Yeah, well, look, look, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I, like, I, like, I like what I'm hearing. I like the, I like the contact. Uh, they got a, uh, a first baseman. I forgot his name, but he, uh, he's a big, larger human being, so that's a good thing. Uh, everybody was a little bit excited about him. I'm trying to find his name here in the thread, but I can't right now. Somebody, somebody tagged you in the thread. They wanted more information. Like surely Corey Clark oh. has some inside information on this. So I'll ask. Connor I'll, I'll Strickland. Ask around. I'll... Yeah, Connor Strickland was a first baseman, East Georgia State. He was from Bainbridge High School, I think. So uh, two fifteen. I think he's six one two fifteen. So a little bit of that right. threshold that we wanted. But yeah, a little, the, little bigger. Yeah. On, on the flip side, there's like nearly a dozen kids from Florida State that are in the portal. But this is kind of what happens. Uh, the names that might stand out, Ryan Romano, who's a guy who started several games at third base. Dylan Simmons, who got right. some burn at first base and designated hitter. And Nander DeSatis, apparently, is also in the portal. So, Yeah, that one, I think, uh, because, look, I don't know that Nander's getting drafted. And I don't know that he – I don't know that after the way that season ended, the way he batted number one and then that – ghastly error that it, I, it, maybe it's just you can't get back you, you know you can't get the two sides back together I'm not saying meet like screamed at the kid or told him he's not welcome I'm just saying maybe at some point you look for a fresh start because it's not working here um so yeah and that's the thing with baseball I mean I think baseball has always been transfer heavy oh yeah. um always the maybe the most transfer heavy that in track um in in college sports so um it's not a surprise that on a team of 35 kids or whatever they had this year that a third of them would want to leave because yeah they want i mean you get it right you want they want to go play they want to get more bats um so yeah it's probably best for both both sides if 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 changes are made on a number of those kids all right i shouted him out on the podcast the other day so i'll do it again here uh, his name is augie dog apparently i don't know he didn't correct me so i'm gonna go with augie dog Corey. he he ordered hello fresh and he got the chicken euro couscous bowls and he said they're absolutely amazing so mm. just a reminder everybody that we're we're bringing you all together and we're hopefully bringing you together uh with a good dinner courtesy of our friends at hellofresh.com use the promo code wake up 12 you'll get 12 free meals dinners and free shipping. Again, it's uh, HelloFresh.com slash WakeUp12. I pointed this out earlier in the week, but it's all about value, Corey. They say that HelloFresh is 28% cheaper than the local grocery.
you you can't really taste the difference, man. I'm telling you, it's restaurant quality. It is good restaurant quality. Not like I mean, there are a bunch of restaurants that you don't want that quality of food. I'm talking about you're going to a nice upscale restaurant. This is that kind of quality food. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I can't I can't say it any more clear, folks. And HelloFresh gives you plenty of flexibility. Change your delivery dates, your food preferences, your plan sizing. You can even skip a week whenever you want to. Again, HelloFresh.com slash wakeup12. HelloFresh.com, America's number one meal kit. Just when you thought the chicken sandwich war was over, it's coming back in a big way with Zaxby's new signature sandwich. It's a double hand breaded filet, split top bun, three zesty pickles, and if that wasn't enough, it's smothered in Zax sauce or new spicy Zax sauce. That's right, it's such a big deal, we made a totally new sauce to give it the kick it deserves. The other guys won't know what hit them. The new Zaxby's signature sandwich. Have you tried it yet? And don't forget to listen in for the Zaxby's indescribably good player of the week every Monday on Wake Up War Chant. All right, Corey, as we head out, let's grab one question from the mailbag. I guess maybe we can grab a few more later on the week and maybe do another show for the people. I defer to you. Do you want to talk hoops or recruiting? Um, no, I defer to you, buddy. You've read the question. You just go with the question you prefer. I'm, I'm down for either. I can pivot on a dime. Well, you know we, we talked a little bit about golf. We talked a little baseball. Let's, I guess, let's do the round ball as well. Uh, okay. Do quite, I like, I like, I like both. I like the other recruiting questions as well. Uh, but we'll go to this one. It's Mark in Naples, Matt AMCZ, or just M Adam CZ. Wait up, Corey. Hopefully, Brady had a blast at Leonard's camp. It really is well done. I haven't seen my son that happy in a while. He didn't want to leave. Mm. I tell you what, we have some massive dudes on this returning roster. There were at least three guys who towered over Malik Osborne, and he's huge. How do you think the 2021 team is going to fare? Can they make up for losing Raekwon Gray, Balsa, Balsha, I apologize, Scotty Barnes, and MJ Walker? Matthew Cleveland and Caleb Mills were there coaching the kids. They look impressive and should be big contributors, we hope. If we know Leonard, he'll figure out some rotation and put out another solid team. But, man, imagine how good they'd be if at least Raekwon, Gray, and Balsha had stayed. Especially Raekwon. Uh, yes. Either either or, really, but Raekwon especially. By the way, so Raekwon was invited to the Combine, the NBA Combine. Uh, Raekwon and Scotty Barnes were both invited. Uh, MJ Walker and Balsha did not make the cut. So neither one of them were invited to. I think it's, it looked like it was about 60 names. Um, they were not two of the 60 that got invited. I think Balsha left knowing the NBA was a long, long shot, and he just wants to go start making money overseas somewhere, which is fine. Go, good for him. But, uh, yeah, they are big, man. That, that's one thing I noticed. There's like three dudes that you're like, good grief. Are they, they're just monstrous in their size. They do tower over Malik Osborne, who's like 6'8". Um, yeah, you know, and I think Cameron Fletcher is another guy that the kid from Kentucky who was Brady's coach for a day until Brady got swapped onto another team and Brady, Brady, not real happy about that because his team apparently isn't very good and he was on a stack team and then he got moved to a not very good team and it's, he's not enjoying, uh, getting, uh, beaten by 20 points every game, but what are you going to do? It's a good learning lesson, but, uh, you know, Leonard really likes Cameron Fletcher and that's a guy that, you know, he's, he's not as, uh, He's you from know Kentucky. he's not he's as a big transfer a, from Kentucky in case people transfer don't know. from Kentucky, but he's not as big a name as Caleb Mills, obviously, and he's not a guy that you envision because he did almost nothing at Kentucky except leave the team uh, for a stretch, and uh, you know he just was kind of an afterthought. He was like the ninth guy on that team, and he just didn't. Cl he kind of clashed with Calipari, and you didn't really hear about him. So he's not as well known or maybe highly thought of as Caleb Mills is coming in. But I'm telling you, Leonard thinks the guy could be a serious, serious player. So you throw him into the mix too, along with Cleveland and Caleb Mills, and I think you got some guys that can score a multitude of ways. Again, though, it's about you know defense and um, you know just knowing the system, and you know there's a chance, you know I don't know how uh, Anthony Polite's coming back too, but there's a chance that your three leading scorers next year could be three guys that weren't on the team last year. And that's not normally the case at Florida State, where it's just three brand new guys. That means you're learning a new system, and there's going to be some growing pains when you got guys playing together for the first time. Uh, so that's the one, uh, the, the one concern I would have that Raekwon could have really stabilized. But again, I hope Raekwon gets a draft in the first round and plays for 15 years. I get why he left, but I'm just saying that's the one thing I think we won't know 
is how stable they are as a how just how stable they are as a team and uh you know how good they are how good they could be defensively because they haven't you know great defenses know where everybody's going to be offenses too for that matter they play together a long time mj polite raekwon gray they played together a lot a lot of uh, malik too now you got you know you you got two or three guys that might you be might be counting on to be your best players that haven't played together yet so that that can always be a learning curve but i mean it's leonard man and it's this program i assume they'll be pretty good yeah and they're they're staying active too man i don't know how this all works but they're they're still going after players and i wonder if these guys would be eligible i mean they're transfers a guy trey mitchell from umass who's actually the a10 rookie of the year uh, two seasons ago in the year they got cut short by covid apparently is uh one of the teams that he's uh in looking at is florida state i wonder if that's a guy that'd be instantly eligible but he's a guy that dropped i think at a season high last season of let me see what it was 37 points versus LaSalle. oh that'll play i mean i assume they they're all eligible man i think all bets are off yeah so he shot about 52 percent from the field 77 percent from the stripe and he averaged almost 19 points and seven boards a game so okay all right i see you i see what's going on so so a down low guy then i, I guess yeah, I mean he's uh, I mean he's listed as center, but he's only six nine two forty, so I don't think that'd be okay. A, really All right, a but yeah, a guy that can score down low. That's yeah. that that would be needed. That would be nice. So that I mean, would be they, nice. They add another guy like that, and I mean I don't know. I just I I trust Leonard to be able to to seamlessly integrate these guys into what they want to do. Like he and Cy and and you know Stan. I mean they've they've they're, they have a bit of a track record now at this point. Can we say, Corey, that they can oh, bring absolutely. guys in, you know, year one and get it? Yeah, them. I just wonder, you know, last year they had MJ Walker to be like the stabilizing force for Scotty Barnes, MJ and Raekwon. Yeah. And now this year, instead of MJ and Raekwon, it's like Malik and Anthony Polite. Right. Which nothing against those two guys. They're just not as good as those other two guys, in my opinion. Polite Polite's turned into a very nice player, by the way. And Osborne has his moments. But they haven't played as much, and they're not quite at the level, I think, as the combo of Walker and, and Gray. But you're also throwing Caleb Mills into the mix, who, who although he's first year at Florida State, I mean, he has played college basketball before. Matthew Cleveland might be a freak show. Uh, the, the freshmen, I mean, the freshmen are going to play at least a couple of them. So, yeah, man, I, I think the talent's there. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, Leonard will say, I promise you for the first four months of next season, he will say, we got seven new guys. Trying to, you know, he'll do that the whole, look, we've got seven new guys. Anytime you're trying to bring seven new guys, guys, we got seven new, like that'll be the start yeah. of every press conference. Yeah. So get used, get ready for that. But there is something to that. You know, this isn't as talented as Florida State will be this year, and they do have some guys that will probably play in the league or get a, at least a look. This isn't where Duke and Kentucky just load up with lottery picks. Like, yes, it's hard, even for Kentucky and Duke, it's hard to get these freshmen to play well and play together early. But they're all ta so talented that sometimes they can play through it and it doesn't matter. They don't have as many lumps. They don't take as many lumps as a team like Florida State might. Then again, I, you know, I, I think we'd all be surprised if they didn't make the tournament. Yeah. Just what they do. I don't think they're going to be a one seed, but I think they can make the tournament. And you get in the tournament, give yourself a chance. That's all I'm saying, Aslan. That's right. All right, we got another one from uh, Mark, but we'll save it for uh, the next show of the week as well as some other recruiting questions from Daryl. And our guy, Derek, who always brings some pretty good questions to the table. So uh, check out Warchant.com. We're going to have plenty of updates from the five-star challenge in Atlanta. Michael Lanks and myself will be up in Atlanta. So we'll do that. I'm sure Corey will be staying busy as well down here. Uh, we'll catch up with you folks uh, with one more show this week because that's what we do, right, Corey? We're going to lose you three a week because you wouldn't let us do anything less. Yeah, I mean, we owe it to the people, Aslan. That's right. He's Corey. I'm Aslan. Thanks for listening to Wake Up Warchant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. <laughs> Come explore our world of coffee. DeLuna Coffee features over two dozen different blends. DeLuna's unique roasts can be delivered ground finely for drip coffee makers, coarse for the craft crowd, untouched as a whole bean, or even in convenient K-cups. Founded in 2014 by the Lemmix family, Ed and Brett are FSU alums and boosters who are extending a special offer to all listeners. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram.